I take this opportunity to thank ACCLMP Assam chapter for inviting me to give this lecture on genetic disorders, a biochemical perspective. Uh, there are two characters in Ramayan. Uh, I'm showing you in this picture. Uh, identify them. I'll discuss about this towards the end of my presentation. Some basic unanswered question when we get a child of this nature. What is the problem with this child? How can it be treated? Is there a cure? Will my next child be affected in this similar way? This is the basic query that any parent has when they have a child with some kind of deformities. So I am taking you into a journey of a less explored path that is the path of genetic disorders. I am here to share my experience. The idea over here is not to say that I am great that I did it. The idea is to infuse the kind of confidence in all of you that if I can do it, all of you can do it. So we'll start this first case of Tina. She was a 12 year old girl, a classmate of my daughter. Uh, she required frequent blood toppings because she had some blood disorders. And this led up to jokes being created that she's a vampire and all the other things. And the worst case was she had aloe antibodies, so even getting a blood transfusion for this thal thalassemic child was very difficult. In my lab, with a basic simple apparatus, the PCR, we were able to find out what was the mutation of the child. We were able to do the sequencing of the chorionic villi to find out whether the next child that the parent had had thalassemia or not. We were able to do HLA typing using the same thermocycler and then we were able to offer her a bone marrow transplant. Post bone marrow transplant, her dependence on transfusions drastically came down. This is case 2, a 70 year old lady presented with dark patches in her eyes and ears. There were history of joint pains and this was not being relieved by medication. A simple test that probably we teach a first MBBS. No guesses. This is Benedict's test, a black reduction, a case of alcaptonuria. Now this is a case who present with anemia and photosensitivity. If you notice his teeth, there was this characteristic brownish discoloration all over his teeth. This is called erythrodontia. When you under look, when you look at it under a UV fluorescence, you can see this pink, bright pink fluorescence. Clinically, the diagnosis is confirmed, but then how do you confirm that it is congenital erythropoietic porphyria? For that, we searched the net. We found out that there's one Dr. Cecil Ged in France, who's been doing a lot of work in sequencing congenital erythropoietic porphyria. We sent her a mail. She asked us to send the samples. We sent the blood sample of the index child and the family. And this is the report we got. A case of congenital erythropoietic porphyria with a urosynthase 1 mutation, which is properly annotated over here. It's as simple as that. This is another case of a very disgruntled patient who came fighting with me in my lab because his bilirubin levels were fluctuating and it was a pretty un uh, unhappy situation. We suspected that the patient was having Gilbert syndrome. We searched the internet for articles on Gilbert syndrome, specifically with the keywords primers for Gilbert syndrome. And then we got that. We synthesized the primers. We did the PCR for the targeted region and then sent those PCR products for sequencing. And there we got the seven triple 80, seven 80 repeats, which is a signature mark for Gilbert syndrome. There was a child with mental retardation and the clinical suspicion of mucopolysaccharidosis is very high. A simple urine test, methylene blue test. Take a filter paper, mark a circle, put the drop of urine of a positive control. This is a child who had mucopolysaccharidosis. This is a normal patient and this was the index case. Put the drop of urine, let it dry, dip this filter paper in methylene blue and have a look. If you see this dark ring in the margin that's mucopolysaccharidosis the classical textbooks teaches you that there should be some uh, alteration in color metachromasia should be seen you don't get to see that but just this ring 
which is not seen in a control in the in a uh, normal patient is confirmed is suggestive of mucopolysaccharidosis. I had a very good friend of mine, Colonel R. K. Sanjeev, a pediatrician who used to say the genetic disorders individually are very rare. But when you look at genetic disorders collectively, they form a sizable chunk of patients who are not being treated properly. So that it is up to us to do something for these patients. So when we talk about a workup of an index case, the first thing that comes to our mind is a mass spec. Mass spectrometry, MSMS, LCMSMS, 2.5 crores. If you want to do some genetic workup, then probably you need a next gen sequencing or a Sanger sequencer. You're taking the budget up by 1.5 to 2.5 crores, way beyond the scope of any normal lab. That's why nobody is doing anything about it. Or should we revisit the doctor in our cells? Suspect a case, collect the sample, outsource it to labs which are doing LCMS, MS, outsource it to lab which are doing next gen sequencing, get the report and interpret the report and give advice. Now, when we talk about an LCMS, MS in my lab, am I actually thinking like a doctor? Or am I thinking like a technician? We need the instrument. We need to do the scan. We need to standardize the protocols. We need to run the controls. We need to see the area under curve. Is that a technician job or is it the doctor's job? Or is it the doctor's job to interpret the result and advise the patient as to what is to be done next? This is a food for thought. Now, in the inborn errors of metabolism, We've come, a lot of, come across a lot of enzymatic defects. As a teacher, I teach the students. As a students, they also learn. But what are we actually doing? As a teacher, I put them as beautiful MCQ questions. As a student, he remembers Newman Peck's disease plus plus minus minus. Uh, the second one is Gaucher's is minus minus plus plus minus minus. So with this pattern, you approach an MCQ. And you know what is this? So if we were suspecting an inborn error of metabolism, like the first case I showed you about that filter paper with methylene blue test to show the thick ring. Now I want to know what is the enzymatic defect. So what we do is we can do it either in a fibroblast culture, which is rather difficult. The more easier thing is take the whole blood, lyse all the RBCs, get a WBC pellet that is you put the lysis buffer all the RBCs get lysed out centrifuge you get a pellet in the bottom and this pellet is full of the WBCs then what you do you sonicate it so that the, all the WBCs are destroyed and the enzymes which are in the cytoplasmic component of the WBC becomes free then incubate this enzyme with an appropriate substrate now we are looking for a particular enzymatic defect the enzyme acts on a substrate. So these substrates are commercially available. Sigma has probably most of the substrates for any of the inborn errors of metabolism. The substrate is linked to a fluorescent dye, which is by the typical chemical bond. So when I incubate the WBC lysate with the substrate, if the enzyme is present, it will act on the substrate, cleave the fluorescent dye and make the fluorescent dye free. So we start getting fluorescence. So if we get fluorescence, that means the enzyme deficiency is not there. When we don't get fluorescence, that means the enzyme was not there in the WBC, which could cleave the uh, bond that we are looking for. And hence that enzyme defect is present. It's a very simple way for picking up any of the enzymatic disorders. If we don't get fluorescence, it could be enzyme deficiency as I talked about it or could there be any other option? Here's a concept of check enzyme. Now it's very unlikely that a person will be suffering both from Gaucher's disease and Tay-Sachs disease together. So if I've done the enzyme assay for Gaucher's disease and that enzyme deficiency is present, then what I do is I test the same sample for Tay-Sachs disease. Now, ideally in Gaucher's, I didn't get fluorescence. 
when I do the Tay-Sachs disease, I should get fluorescence because it's unlikely the person will be having Gaucher's and Tay-Sachs simultaneously. If I get a negative response even in Tay-Sachs disease, if I don't get fluorescence when investigating for Tay-Sachs disease, then that means that there is a problem with the sample. So that is the check enzyme we need to do. This will confirm that A enzyme is deficient but B enzyme is okay. That suggests that A enzyme is deficient. A enzyme is deficient, B enzyme is also deficient suggests that the sample is defective. Now many a times when we do this check enzyme studies, we find out that the original studies that we were doing was wrong, suspicion was wrong, but the patient actually had a different genetic disorder which picked up in this check enzyme studies. Now, how do we do these enzymatic studies? In Dr. Seema Kapoor's lab while I was working, she showed me this book and she said that this is very close property. However, a little bit of friend help with my friends in the IT you can download this PDF. This book tells you exactly how to make the buffer, what are the compositions of it, what is the steps, what is the procedures, how do you get the colors. This is what most of the genetic disorder labs are following. They take a particular test, standardize it, do it. Gradually, these tests are being automated and they will start coming into the biochemistry platform where everybody will be able to do it. Amino acid urea, this is what I learned in Gangaram Hospital. A th simple thin layer chromatography and observe the bands of the amino acids in the chromatography paper. This is all that is required. Then we teach our kids the uh, color reactions of proteins, which is basically a signature color reaction for the amino acids. Do the same tests and you get the results. Gangaram, not so long ago, was using thin layer chromatography and color tests for confirming diagnosis of amino acid ureas. Now they've shifted on to LCMS, MS, and we can also do that. This is the setup I had in my college. This is a normal specimen jar. This is butanol, acetone, acetic acid. That's all you require. And you can do thin layer chromatography. The TLC papers are ready-made available in the market. Color reactions, we have proudly removed it out from our curriculum, but these are the tests which are being used in advanced labs for confirming amino acid ureas. Okay, so the whole talk was about how to approach a case of a genetic disorder. Look at the child, look at a pattern match. Like this child has got a microcephaly, so look at all the uh, genetic disorders which have microcephaly come to a pattern identification and say okay this could be the probable diagnosis a b c you got the probable diagnosis a b c and then go the first way which i did check up in the net who is working on it send the sample get the results or search the internet for the molecular primers design the pcrs do the pcrs not too taxing especially in the days of uh, gradient pcrs Standardize the test, get the results. You have a set of primers for now reduplicating in any other cases that come forward. I have done both the methods and I can say with confidence that both the methods are easy. And if you still don't get an answer, next gen sequencing. Always there, Brahmastra, anything you can get on this. Okay, which film is this? Right, this is Sholay. Look at another picture from the same movie, another picture. Now, if you have not seen the movie, you will not be able to relate this picture with this picture with this picture. The clinicians have just seen the movie. They remember this scene. They remember that congenital erythroporphyria is characterized by urosynthase uro, 3 deficiency, which presents with ABCD. And they don't know that the whole metabolism porphyria has got other scenes also which could affect the clinical presentation depending on where the enzyme defect is. We have seen the entire movie but we are still we are underconfident of treating it and the clinicians have just seen a spot scene and they are very happy treating it. Superficial knowledge breeds to arrogance. 
true knowledge induces humility so when the pediatricians are not wanting us to come into their field now you know why okay i have given a label to the child then what we can use preventive strategies we can in participate in national screening programs we have diets which are deficient in amino acids we have enzyme replacement therapies starting enzyme replacement therapies and following up the patient is a new upgrowing evolving specialty i have a friend of mine in uk who does this job and i found it very interesting so the aim of this presenting is that these diseases are existing the very common if you start looking for them they are there making diagnosis is relatively easy the cases which i have showed you are the cases which i have worked to the end without any high tech lab support in peripheral hospitals in the lab of a biochemistry department it's possible to do it if i can do it so can you now you have to decide which state are you are you in the state of i won't currently i am in the state that i can do it and i really wish that somebody gets up and says yes i did it the need of the r is just to get lost rid of this t from i can't do it to i can do it bring about a change the biochemistry we teach is glycolysis and this is what everybody hates any time you talk about biochemistry this is what they think but we need to bring a translational change we need to be able to use these tests as diagnostic tools we need to be able to identify the enzymatic defects we need to get into the field of enzyme replacement therapy we need to bring a paradigm change from a mother who thinks all is lost to a father thinks that yes there is hope this is the paradigm change that we need to bring yeah i got this store picture in the beginning for those who have guessed it right yes this is hanuman no brainers this is jamwan but what does jamwan and this scene have to do in the talk which i am giving hanuman had tremendous amount of potentials but it required somebody like jamwan to wake him up and make him realize what his true potential is and that's what does hanuman with this presentation i just want to be a small jamwan and wake up all the biochemists to make a start in this lab that we are doing a very simple lab that we are doing get out the benedict's test benedict's test positive dipstick for glucose negative that is galactosemia color test for amino acids thin layer chromatography for amino acids mucopolysaccharide screening using the simple methylene blue or toluidine blue dyes simple reagents that all the labs have it there is glac glucose lactate ammonia electrolytes ketone bodies this is the first workup for any child which is showing signs of failure to thrive all these tests we can do it in our lab If you are in a slightly advanced lab, do PCRs for thalassemia. I have a video in my YouTube channel, and I shared it in this association also. But what are the strategies for antenatal detection of thalassemias? Optimize PCRs and send the samples outside for sequencing. Sequencing of PCR product just costs three hundred rupees. Synthesizing a primer for anything costs just two thousand rupees. So any PCR you want to do and any sequencing you want to do is definitely affordable. in a site advanced lab we can collect dried blood spots and send them for investigation for in lcms and they interpret the results and educate the patients or the clinicians in the more advanced labs yes we are going to talk about mass spec we are going to talk about next gen sequencing we are going to talk about biochemical genetics we are going to talk about mlps i'm not telling you that it's going to be easy but i'm going to tell you that it's going to be worth doing it nay dishai the way forward thank you for a patient listening